Well, good morning. Welcome to Oak Bridge Community Church. A lot of, a lot, you'd think that people would be here on time. We get an extra hour of sleep tonight and everything, right? You guys all feeling refreshed, ready to go today? All right, there we go. So, um, welcome to Oak Bridge Community Church. If you're visiting with us today, we'd love for you to stop by the information uh, booth that's right outside there in the foyer, and they can give you a packet there that tells you a little bit about what goes on at the church throughout the week and, and here on Sunday mornings. There's also a couple coupons that you can take advantage of and get a free beverage at our cafe, and you can head to our bookstore and get a free T-shirt for yourself and, and for those of the people that are with you. And then just a few announcements for you. We, we don't take communion together as a group, so if you've been used to going to a church that does that. We, we don't do that here, but we have a room behind us called the Reflection Room. You can go through the bookstore, or through the hallway, and uh, you can remember why we gather here in a special way in that room, and you can take the emblems and remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ that was sacrificed for us. You can also write out prayers there that we pray over during the week. The prayer team prays over, uh, and I would just encourage everybody here to take advantage of that. And then also, we don't take an offering during this service, so if you're visiting with us, we, we trust that God's going to speak, that God's going to work during the service, and we want you to enjoy that. If Oak Bridge is your home, then we would just ask you to give generously with a smile on your face, and you guys know where the joy boxes are at. So right. what else you got? You got a serving ministry fair to talk about. We do. Out front, um, I would encourage you after the service, we, we, we've got all kinds of different ministries set up and give you a little information. And if you're not on a serving team, I would tell you that you're really missing out. First of all, the church needs you, but second of all, you, you are closest to Christ. I think we, you know, we get so much more out of it when we serve, um, when we're giving, than whether when we're just receiving. So yeah. I'd encourage you to check that out. I want to ask a couple questions for you guys in there. How many of you guys think you're compassionate? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you guys think that you're giving? How many of you guys think that uh, you've got tech skills? Raise your hand. Everybody below the age of 50, maybe, right? <laughs> Uh, some, some that have it oh, beyond that. How many of you guys uh, believe that you can hold babies? Raise your hand. Yeah. I mean, I could go on and on. How many of you guys believe that you can wave uh, a parking lot stick and look like Darth, Darth Vader out of the parking lot and do that? Here's the bottom line. All these things are needed to make a church grow, and it, they're very, very important. Every morning, we use a, a, a couple hundred volunteers at, at the church to make this thing run, and all of you have been gifted. And you say, well, it's not that important. It is that important. And let me just give you an example. It's a personal testimony. I had a woman that the first church, I wasn't a Christian yet. First church I went to, uh, they didn't greet me well in the parking lot. So we walked away from that place. The second one, a woman just said, I'm so glad that you guys are here. And I thought she was genuine, and I felt it, and she changed my eternal zip code. Can I say that again? My eternal zip code was changed. I came to know Christ because of her greeting. You never know how God will use your gift that you surrender to him. You never know what he's going to do, whether it's in the bookstore, whether it's as an usher, whether it's as a greeter, whether the information center, the cafe. God may use your smile to have somebody who's had a very, very tough week to know that was the actual smile that gave them hope. So I would encourage all of you that aren't involved in a serving team, go sign up at the uh, that fair right out front. And our children's ministry has roughly, they go through about 120 volunteers uh, in a given time period, like within a two-week time period at our church, they're looking at another 125 more, meaning that's how many people they need to serve. So you could go right in the community auditorium, get more information there, and here's the deal. You're not signing your life away. You're not signing up to do this for the next 30 years. It's not like a prison sentence. If after three or four months you don't like it, then just tell the person, look, this is not for me. They'll let you go, and you figure something else out. But like Herc said, the church needs you, but you're going to find out that, that when you do it, you needed it. It's a great thing. Yeah, what definitely. Else and then in line with that, we want to, you know, everything here is, is run by volunteers. Hundreds and hundreds of volunteers here at Oak Bridge. And we want to thank you and, and really celebrate you in a special way on the night of November the 17th. If you've been serving in a ministry regularly during the year of 2017, then I want to make sure that you guys hit up your ministry leader and there should be a form that they give you that will give you an entrance into the evening that night. And um, so hunt them down if they haven't given it to you yet and we have a great night of food you get we turn this place into a shopping center and you get I think it's 80 bucks to go around and shop and 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 so that's all cool and we say thank you but also the place you'll get the preview in the first night of it's decorated for Christmas yeah right? the whole so building that's, that's November cool. 17th doors open at 6 15 get your uh, form like Herc said from your ministry there it's a great night for all you volunteers that make this happen we are grateful beyond what you can imagine we really are yep. Baptism service coming up on December the 3rd. December 3rd, mm -hmm. that's right. 
There's approximately eight or nine signed up. Our goal is to have 30. That's what we've been praying about. So you can go right out to the information center, sign up for that. We can give you more information after you sign up. But if you've not made that decision to be baptized after you've believed, you should. That's what Jesus says. Therefore, go into the world, make followers of all the nations, then baptize them. So that's a great step of obedience and see what God does with that. Mm-hmm. And then third. last year we had our first annual kind of Be Rich Month, Be Rich campaign, and that really kicks off today, next week. You want to talk about that? Yeah, we pushed it off this week because we got a special announcement we wanted to tell you today that we're going to talk about. At the end of service, you'll hear what it is. But this Be Rich campaign, how many of you guys know what the big Be Rich campaign is? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you do not know? Raise your hand. This will be good. Okay, last year we asked everybody that was in our church to give $39.95. So the Be Rich campaign is we learn how to be rich before God. How does it look like to be rich with the things that we have? So we asked everybody to give $39.95. So an example would be my family. I gave $39.95. Kathy gave $30.95. That's on and above the tithes and the offerings that we bring to the church. So for your family, what would it be? I've got five of us living at home, so that would be five times $39.95. So So we teach our kids, like, here's a Christmas present for you, Trip, which I'm going to give my two grandkids $39.95. $39.95. I'm gonna That's a real them. sacrifice for them then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And I'm going to say now, you guys can learn to be generous and bless others by giving that to our church. Now, I don't know if a four-year-old and two-year-old will understand that, but we're at least setting a principle in place. With that said, we've got about 10 ministries that we support over the course of the year, from crisis pregnancy centers to Feed My Peoples to whatever you name, that are in the community. And so last year, we raised a certain amount of money that you'll be able to see. This year, we'll have another goal that you'll be able to see, but I wanted to let you guys know right off the top here, that I got a phone call from a guy named Frankie Charles this past week. Frankie Charles runs a church and a school down in Haiti called Oak Bridge Church and Oak Bridge School. Frankie said, hey, Tom, um, this year we have about 70 kids, 60 to 70 kids signed up for our school, and we had to move further away than where they were originally at. And this winter, we expect in January another 50 to sign up, so they need about 120. And I said, well, that's great, Frankie. What can we do? And he says, well, we need some transportation for these kids. He says, so I need $7,000. And I'm thinking, you need 7000 bucks." And I'm trying to get my mind around this. For 50 kids, I said, well, Frankie, that's not going to work. $7,000, you put four people in a car, you're 20 minutes away. You know, how many times you got to shuttle back and forth, 20 there, 20 back, 20 there, 20 back. And Frankie said, no, Pastor Tom, you don't understand. It's $7,000 for a school bus that holds 40 to 50 kids. So, so here's what I said. I said, Frankie, I can't promise you anything. But at the end of this month, I'm going to guess that our church wants to be rich before God's eyes and wants to bless a guy who has no resources, except the hope that other people who love Jesus will surrender some of theirs. So this is a month that you want to show up next week and the week after. We've got some phenomenal messages that will line you up to see how God looks at our resources and how we should look at them. So I just encourage you guys to sign up for that um, Watch this video. It shows you what we raised last year. It shows you what our goal this year is. And then Hercules in prayer. Turn your eyes to the screens. Can you be rich? The scripture says that we can be rich in good deeds. That's what God considers rich. Challenging all you guys to bring $39.95 on and above what you normally give. We would take 100% of those funds and we would bless our partners with some checks that they won't believe. So would you pray with me? Yeah. I want to say a prayer. Dear God, um, we know that you have resourced us well, that we are amazingly rich compared to most of the people in this world and most of the people throughout the history of this world. Father, help us to be grateful. Help us to be thankful for what you have given to us and help us to realize, God, that you say that it is more blessed to give than to receive. So during this month, as we as we want to take what you've given to us and and impact other local ministries uh, and worldwide ministries, Father, uh, that, that might take care of spiritual needs, but also physical needs that people have while they're while they're on this earth. And God, we just pray that 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 we have hearts that are generous, um, and we pray that you will take the money that we give and then 
that we receive and then give out to these partners, Father, and that you will bless it and multiply it and, and just use it to further your kingdom. God, we come this morning um, grateful, grateful for the fact that we get to celebrate a king who is alive, grateful for the fact that, that you love us and care for us and that you are on the throne and we get to be a part of what you're doing. So, Father, just prepare our hearts to worship, to learn today, to be changed, to go out pumped up, to be a light in the world that needs it so desperately. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let's stand up, say hello to somebody around you, and then we're going to sing.
before you sit down, I want to give you a time to go to God and just speak to Him. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who brings our prayers to you boldly and confidently. We thank you that you're not far from us. You're close. It's in your son's name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Please take a seat. <clears throat> Welcome if you're watching online. And uh, we had a powerful service this morning. I, it's been a, hasn't it been a great morning so far this morning? Just, I don't know about you. But... I'm going to come up and say something in a second, but we're going to watch something before that. But here's what I kind of wanted to ask you guys. Have any of you guys ever seen Bono in concert? You two? Anybody? Right. How about uh, Billy Joel concert? Okay. Well, if you were going to one of those concerts, let's say at Bush Stadium, you'd probably pay $150 to $500 a seat, depending on where you're sitting, right? I mean, they're really expensive tickets. And if you're not in the first, say, 30 rows there's a good chance you're going to be looking at a screen. Now, the experience is still going to be great. You're not going to feel like you got ripped off for everything, but you will be watching from a screen. Every year, at least in the past few years, past 10 or so years, I've went with about uh, 70 people from our church, all college students, down to an to organization called Passion in Atlanta, Georgia, where there's between 50 and 60,000 college students that gather to hear Chris Tomlin, uh, Christian Stanfill, Louis Giglio, Beth Moore, uh, Matt Redman, all these great speakers and singers, they gather together. And since we bring down 70 people, uh, the normal people are just from colleges all over. They bring three or four people, just random people just drive down there. Since we bring so many, Passion has been gracious enough to give us a box in the top of one of these stadiums. So all 70 people can gather together. We're not trying to hunt for each other where we're at. And it's great, except the reality of it is Passion is so super. I'm watching a video screen the whole time. I occasionally look down and see the top of Chris Tomlin's head to make sure that he's there. But it doesn't diminish the experience at all. It is phenomenal. And I would promise you that if you've gone to see a concert, you know, whether it's pick anybody you want, Carrie Underwood or a Christian singer, you've watched it from the screen, it's still been great. When I was at Chris Tomlin's last concert, phenomenal. Didn't diminish it at all. So I want you to think about that for a second. And uh, we're going to watch a video here now in just a second. And it's a phenomenal video. It's kind of one of those ones that pumps me up. I watched this one... Uh, Fairly regularly, I teach a class called Starting Point, and our class is just getting in for this semester. It's got one more week, but we start back up in January. If you guys want to join that, uh, we'd love to have you. I've loved this class, but we watched the message this past week, and I thought, you know what? I kind of want to play that again. And it's kind of this kind of a message. When I was in high school, we would come out of the uh, locker room, and then they'd be playing, another one bites the dust, dun, dun. Another one bites the dust, dun, dun. We are the champions of, you can sing with me if you want. All right. And I'd be fired up and go out there and play a game. And so that's what, this video does that for me. Now, it happens to be a guy named Andy Stanley. And I, I couldn't get Andy to come here personally, all right? So the next best thing is, you watch this video. I'm going to come up and tell you about a major announcement when we're done. But this video, it's, I'm telling you, as I'm watching over there, I'm getting more and more fired up. I think you guys will too. Turn your eyes towards the screen. So Jesus and his apostles, they're walking up to the city, they're going to Caesarea Philippi, and maybe, we don't know, they were talking about, hey, you know, a few years ago, they renamed this city for Caesar, and Caesar Augustus was the first real Roman emperor, and that's when Rome sort of became an empire, shifted away from being a republic. And perhaps they were talking about the fact that Caesar Augustus was actually the adopted son, some of you know this from history, of Julius Caesar, and they had deified Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar was the deified Julius Caesar, which meant Caesar Augustus, the adopted son 
son of Julius Caesar was actually the son of a god. That's what they refer to him as, the son of the deified Julius. That was Caesar Augustus. So Julius, Caesar Augustus, who the city was renamed after, was kind of like son of a god. So they're walking up to the city, sort of talking about that. And then Jesus turns to the apostles and asks this very famous question you've heard before. He says, okay, well, guys, we know who Caesar Augustus was, you know, you know adopted son of the deified Julius Caesar. Who do you think I am? Who do you think I am? Who, what, what do you think, who do you think I am? And so they had this little conversation about who people think Jesus is. And then toward the end of the conversation, Peter blurts out, I'll tell you who I think you are. I think you're the Messiah. You are the son of the living God. Caesar Augustus was son of the, you know, sort of adopted son of the dead God. You're, you're like the son of the living God. You know, he, he passed away. We don't even know where he's buried, but you're the son of the living God. God and Jesus stops and says, bingo, you got it, Peter. In fact, Peter, you're smart, but you're not that smart. God, my father gave you the answer to that question. And then he says something that's astounding. Then he says something maybe if you grew up in church, you've heard before. Then he makes a prediction that I cannot over, um, I cannot exaggerate the significance of. Then Jesus says this, and on this rock, I will build my church. Now there's Catholics and Protestants, we, you know, we differ over what is the rock and Catholics think the rock is Peter because Peter asked the question, that may be true. Protestants say, no, the rock isn't Peter. The rock is the declaration that Christ is the, you know, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And you know, we can debate that, it's kind of fun. But the significance of this conversation wasn't who's the rock and what's the rock. The significance of this conversation is that Jesus made a very bold claim. He says, I'm gonna build my church. Now, as you may know, Jesus probably spoke Aramaic. The New Testament was written in Greek. So when Matthew sat down to tell us about this conversation, he didn't write in Aramaic, he wrote in Greek, and he thought about that Aramaic word that Jesus used to say, I'm gonna build my church, and he chose the little Greek word, ekklesia. And ecclesia, as you may know, is a very common Greek term. It was not a religious term, and it meant gathering, assembly, or congregation. Gathering, assembly, or congregation. So Jesus made a declaration. He said, guys, I'm gonna build my gathering. Now again, picture it, okay? They're 150 miles away from Jerusalem. They're in the sort of middle of nowhere. They're going to Caesarea Philippi, and there's 13 of them, including Jesus and Judas, to kind of balance things out. And Jesus says, guys, I'm going to build my gathering, my congregation, my assembly, my people. And they're looking around like, woohoo, you know. <laughs> you know, we're pretty much outlaws, Jesus. You know, there's a reason we're not in Jerusalem right now. There's a reason we're afraid to go back to Jerusalem. Jesus says, I'm going to build my assembly. And then there was a tragedy of translation. I mean, a major tragedy of translation. As time went by, and as the, the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the Apostle Paul were translated into different languages from Greek, unfortunately, the little word ecclesia wasn't translated. Actually, a German word was superimposed in our text, and it's the word that we, where we get the word church. Now think about the word church. It's kind of like, it almost sounds German if you think about it. Church. In fact, I'm not going to try to pronounce the German word it comes from because every time I do, I get emails from Germans that go, you said it wrong. In fact, they don't even say it the same way. So I'll leave it with those of you who speak German. But the word church is not a translation of the Greek word ecclesia. The word church was superimposed. In fact, the word that the word church comes from doesn't mean gathering assembly. It actually means house of the Lord. So unfortunately, in this tragedy of, trans, of translation, instead of the idea of a gathering or assembly or a people of Jesus or a Jesus people or a Jesus gathering or a Jesus assembly, instead, we got this word church that actually denotes a place, house of the Lord. But here's what you need to understand today. Jesus did not predict a place. Jesus predicted a people. And Matthew knew that because Matthew was there and when he sat down to write out his gospel in Greek, he chose the word ekklesia, which was not a religious term. It simply meant a gathering or a people. In fact, you should know this and we'll move on. In the 16th century, a man named William Tyndall, you've heard of William Tyndall. William Tyndall decided to, to translate the New Testament from Greek into English. He's the first person to translate the entire New Testament from Greek into English. And when he got to the word ecclesia, he was stunned. And by his own account, it was like, oh my goodness, ecclesia doesn't mean house of the Lord. 
Ecclesia, the idea of ecclesia doesn't reflect the German word and the word from which we get church. And so in his translation of the, of the New Testament, the first English translation of the New Testament, he translated the word ecclesia into congregation. He said, Jesus said, on this rock, I'm going to build a congregation of people. Jesus didn't predict a place. Jesus predicted a people. And then, of course, those that were in charge of the church eventually arrested William Tyndall. They said he was a heretic because of his translation of the New Testament, among other things. They strangled him, burned him at the stake. But he was correct. Well, after Jesus made this incredible prediction, I'm gonna build my people. You know, they went to Caesarea Philippi, traveled around, eventually they go back to Jerusalem. They said, don't go, don't go, don't go. He said, I'm going anyway. Jesus is arrested and crucified. And after the crucifixion, as we mentioned last week, if we had gone to Peter and the apostles and said, hey, now who do you think Jesus is? You still think he's the Messiah, the son of the living God? Peter would have said, no. We were wrong. Do you still think he's gonna build a gathering? Do you think there's gonna be a Jesus assembly? Do you think there's gonna be a Jesus congregation? Do you think there's gonna be an ecclesia of Jesus? And Peter and the guys would have said, no, because he's dead and he's gone. And yet, as we said last week, something changed because these very same men that watched him die and ran for their lives when Jesus was arrested were the very same men surrounded by a group of women that had been Jesus followers who suddenly come back to life. And they say, we're back because we have seen a risen savior. And after Jesus came back from the dead, after Jesus rose from the dead, he gathered his handful of followers. We don't know how many people were there, maybe about 120. And then he said these very famous words that tied into his prediction about one day there would be a Jesus gathering, a Jesus congregation. Here's what he said. Matthew 28 tells us, then Jesus came to them. Matthew, who gave us the prediction. Then Jesus came to them. This is his followers after the resurrection. Then Jesus came to them and then, look at this. He said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now, I don't want to be disrespectful. I don't want to be sacrilegious. Not only are we in church, but I'm the preacher, okay? But I want you to think just for a moment about this statement. Jesus stands before 120 people or so on a hillside after the resurrection, and he says, okay, may I have your attention, please? All authority, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Can you think of a more arrogant statement than that? All authority has been given to me. Either it's an extraordinarily arrogant statement or it's true. And perhaps the only reason his audience that day were not offended by that statement, that audacious statement of, you know, all authority has been given to me is because (laughs) they were looking at a man that they had seen crucified. And when you predict your own death and resurrection and then pull it off, If you say all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, you say, absolutely it has. We've never seen anybody do that before. He said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, in light of the fact that all authority has been given to me, in light of the fact that I have all authority in heaven and earth, in light of the fact that I could ask you to do anything or I could do anything, here's how I want to channel all that authority. Here's how I want to channel all of that energy. Here's what I'm going to do with all authority that has been handed and given to me. Don't you know they're on the edge of their seats? All authority has been given to me. Therefore, you go and you make disciples of all nations. Do what? Yep. Here's what I want you to do. And I have the authority to ask you to do it, he would say. Now imagine, it's hot, it's dusty, they are fugitives from the law, they are outlaws, they're crazy, they have no influence, they have no connections, they have no money, they have no organization. And Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into all the nations of the world. Yes, I see that hand. What's a nation? Okay, we'll get to that. I want you to go into all the ethnic groups. I want you to go to all the people groups in the whole world. Yeah, see that hand. How are we gonna get there? Okay, just let me finish. I want you to go into all the nations of the world. And I want you to make Jesus followers of all the people from all the nations in the world. Then he said, and surely, 
at the end. He said, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. <laughs> and then he left. <laughs> I'm with you always. Where did he go? He left. <laughs> I'm with you always as you go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And then he left. And they went back to Jerusalem. And a few days later, as we talked about last week, and as you can read in the first, second, and third chapters of the book of Acts, this group of people who had watched Jesus die, who had seen a resurrected Savior, who had heard him say, go into all the nations, went into the streets of Jerusalem. And as we said last week, their message was simple. You killed him. God raised him. We've seen him. Say you're sorry. That was their four-point message, remember? Hey, you killed him. The people of Jerusalem, you were there. God raised him. We've seen him. Say you're sorry. And suddenly... The Jesus gathering was born. Suddenly, the movement started moving. Suddenly, the, the, the book of Acts tells us that hundreds and eventually thousands of people, not halfway around the world, not a hundred years later, but thousands of people within the city of Jerusalem where these events took place began to say, Jesus has been raised from the dead. God has done something significant in our midst. And the church began to grow and grow and grow. And the church was born. And this is important. Not around truth claims. Every religion gets its start around truth claims. This began, the Jesus gathering began around an event, the resurrection of Jesus. And for about two years, things went really, really well. For about two years, Peter and Andrew in particular, they went north to some cities, they went to the coast, they went south. They went, you know, about 100 miles north, about 80 miles south to the coast, east and west. And several of them began to circ you know, um, move around the Jerusalem or what we would call modern day Israel or the whole area where we would call Palestine or back then Palestine. And they began to spread the word. And so for about two years, things went really well. And then something horrible happened. The movement stopped moving. And the gathering stopped growing. And a persecution broke out. And some of the Christians were scattered just to escape the persecution. But suddenly the Jesus movement began to bog down. And then something happened that's not recorded for us in the scripture. So if, if you're new to church or you're new to one of our churches, understand that what I'm about to tell you did, is not in the scriptures. But something happened and here's my version of what happened. So here's my version of what happened. Apparently, there was a conversation in heaven that went something like this. God the Father called Jesus over and said, son, come over here, I need to, I need to show you something. And he pointed down on the earth, he said, look, the movement's not moving. The gathering's not growing. We have a problem. And Jesus looked and he said, you're right. And God the Father said to Jesus, apparently, look, I, I think that those, those fellows you chose, they're, they're nice guys, you know, the fishermen and the tax collector, but they're just content. You said to go into all nations. I think they may have heard you say neighborhoods because they're kind of staying in the neighborhood. <laughs> they're not really going anywhere. They seem to be content to sort of be rock stars, you know, in the climate and in the culture where you did all these things. I think that perhaps you need to go find somebody else to help you out. I think you need to go find a leader. I think you need to go find somebody who's not afraid to get on a boat and go somewhere. I think you need to find somebody who's a little bit better educated, who can speak but, you know, several different languages. I think you need to find somebody who's viewed as a religious leader so that they'll take him seriously. I think you need to find somebody that can speak to both Jews and Gentiles. I think you should find somebody that perhaps is a Roman citizen. In fact, just to be, have, make it fun, why don't you go down there and find yourself a good Pharisee and recruit him? Because these guys, they're not getting the job done. And then God the Father said, hey, 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 look at that guy. And Jesus looked and said, Saul of Tarsus? And God's going, yeah, look at him go. And Jesus said, yeah, but he's like dismantling the whole thing. Like, look, he's actually arresting my followers and putting them in jail and causing them to blaspheme. I mean, he's on a tear. He's, on a, he's a one-man wrecking machine. In fact, look, I think he's going to undo everything I spent so much time to do. And God the Father said, I know, he's awesome. I think you should go down there. <laughs> I think you should recruit him. And Jesus said, all right, whatever. And in Acts chapter nine, now that's just my version. I don't know exactly how it happened, but here's, here's what I want you to know. If you are considering Christianity, if you're considering coming back to maybe your roots or maybe this whole thing is new for you, if you get your New Testament, go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and go to Acts chapter nine, you can read the story, and this is amazing. You can read the story of the conversion of the apostle who became the apostle Paul that we know was, came into history as Saul of Tarsus. Now, Saul of Tarsus is a real problem for skeptics. 
Saul of Tarsus is a real problem for people who say, ah, you can't trust the New Testament and these things never happened. Saul of Tarsus, who became the Apostle Paul, is a problem because the Apostle Paul wrote his letters that comprised the New Testament in the 50s, not 100 years after the events of Jesus' life, within just 20 or so years after Jesus' life. And his life is documented for us in the book of Acts and his letters are written and he knew Peter and he knew John and he knew James, the brother of Jesus. In fact, at one point, it's kind of interesting and I'm kind of filling in some details. He went to Jerusalem after the apostle, after he became the apostle Paul and decided that he wanted to reach Gentiles, not just Jews. And he went to Jerusalem and he gathered all the Jesus followers, especially the, the people who were leading the church in Jerusalem, the ones that just weren't willing to go anywhere. And he said, look, this movement's got to move. This gathering's got to grow. This isn't a message for Jewish people. This isn't a message for Middle Eastern people. This is a message for the whole world. God has done something in our midst and the world is supposed to know. To which, you know, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, and the rest of them went, that's right. So Paul said, we need a strategy. So he put a big map up on the wall. I'm making this part up too. He put a big map up on the wall. He said, all right, well, let's divide up the world. Let's divide up the Roman world. And he drew a circle around Jerusalem. And he said, you guys take Jerusalem. And I'll take everything else. And he did. And he got on a ship. And he went all around the Mediterranean, edge of the Mediterranean, to all the major port cities, anywhere there were synagogues, anywhere there were Jews and Gentiles, anywhere there were converts to Judaism from the world of the Gentiles and the Romans and the Greeks. And he spent, ready for this, 30 years of his life 30 years, the Apostle Paul traveled and was arrested and beaten and imprisoned and stoned. Then he traveled and started churches and started churches and was thrown out of cities. For 30 years of his life, he traveled establishing little ecclesias all around the port cities of the Roman world. And everywhere he would go, he didn't repeat the Sermon on the Mount. He didn't repeat all the parables. He preached that God has done something in our midst. Jesus has been raised from the dead as proof of it. In fact, when we started this series, we found him in the city of Athens on one of these trips during those 30 years, where everywhere he went, he shared that God has done something in our midst. For 30 years, he planted little Jesus gatherings all over the known world. And then in his early 60s, he was arrested one more time and taken to Rome. In fact, he was imprisoned in Rome twice. The first time they let him out, interesting story there. But the second time he was imprisoned in Rome, Nero, was the emperor. And no doubt the apostle Paul knew that this was the end. He had been warned, don't let them take you to Rome. Appeal, he allowed them to take him to Rome. He was imprisoned in Rome. Now imagine, now here's where we have to slow down and just think for just a minute. In a world that we can't relate to, in a world that's so ancient, in a world where nothing that we think is normal was normal, in a world where there was really very little appeal, in a world dictated by the words of the Emperor Nero, in a world where Christians were fair game for any kind of torture, any kind of abuse, especially non-Jewish Christians, the Gentile Christians. The Apostle Paul finds himself imprisoned and perhaps he wondered, did it work? Did it work? Will they do to the rest of the church and to the rest of the Christians what they did to Jesus and now what they're about to do with me? Was it a pipe dream? Were we crazy to think that this Jesus gathering, this movement of churches, these little ecclesias, were we crazy to think that somehow it could survive the Roman Empire? A world that's committed to worshiping, you know, Jupiter and some parts of the world, Zeus still? where Mars is the God of war? Are, are, were we crazy to think that somehow this thing that Jesus did in our midst in Jerusalem would somehow get outside of that, that small little part of the world and make a difference? Were we crazy to think that when Jesus said, go into all nations, that somehow that would, that would work? And there he sat in a Roman prison in Rome, days away from being executed, wondering in his early 60s, middle, mid-60s, and then one morning, probably before the sun rose, he heard the Praetorian coming down those stone steps. They opened his cell, marched him out, and that would be the morning, that would be his last morning on the planet. Now, I need you to use your imagination on steroids for just a second. I want you to imagine that you and I were able to accompany the Apostle Paul from his cell to his execution right outside the city. 
And if we could whisper in his ear, Paul, 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 don't be discouraged. It worked. It worked. Paul, look around the city as they marched in through the Roman Forum. Here's the Roman Forum now. Not much to look at. Fun to visit. This is where, this is where he was in prison. These were the very streets out of which he walked to go outside the city. And imagine that we walked with him. We said, Paul, fear not. We've been to the future. It worked. Look around the city. One day, this city that is adorned with, with um, icons to pagan gods and to the gods of the Romans and the Greeks, one day this very city will be adorned with icons representing Jesus, your Savior. Paul, Paul, listen, listen. On the tops of buildings all over the city, there will be crosses, and they won't be crosses that point to Roman crucifixion. They're going to be crosses to remind people of one single crucifixion, the crucifixion of our Savior. Paul, look right over there. See over there, Nero Circus? Nero Circus was where Nero persecuted Christians, where he allowed wild animals to tear Christians apart, where he fed them to lions, where he crucified Christians, where eventually he would crucify the apostle Peter. Tradition tells us upside down. It was the place where he would impale Christians on stakes, put tar in their hair, and light them on fire to light his gardens because he was the emperor and he could do anything he wanted. And we would say, we would say to the apostle Paul, we'd say, look, you're not going to see the, see the Rome, Nero Circus? Right over there, one day there will be a magnificent building built to commemorate your friend, St. Peter. It will be the most beautiful, perhaps the most beautiful building on the planet. And Paul, someday, thousands and thousands and thousands of people will come to this city from all over the world. And they won't ask, where was Julius Caesar buried? And they won't ask, can we visit Tiberius Palace? They won't ask, where was Caesar Augustus buried? They're gonna come from all over the world and they're gonna ask their tour guides, will you show us where the apostle Paul was imprisoned? Paul, listen, it's hard to imagine this. One day, there will be no Roman Empire but there will be churches in just about every major city and in just about every country in the world. Paul, all those letters that you wrote, all those things that you wrote and you handed them to trusted friends and you hoped they made it to Ephesus and you hoped they made it to Thessalonica and you hoped they made it to the Christians in Rome. You hoped that somehow your teachings and your word would be spread. Paul, one day what you wrote will be translated into over 1,200 different languages and distributed all over the world. Paul, you need to know, one day, one day, one day there's gonna come a time when once a year, families in many, many different countries are going to mention Caesar Augustus, but it won't be because they're retelling his story. The first emperor of Rome, Caesar Augustus, his name will become a footnote in the story of the birth of your savior. Paul, before you go, you need to know, one day, parents will name their children Peter and Paul, and they'll name their dogs Nero and Caesar. <laughs> yeah, that's worth clapping about. Now, here's what I want you to hear, and we're done. Could he have imagined this? Could he have imagined any of the things that we just walked him through? Can we imagine a 60 something year old man being taken outside of the city of Rome? The very city that was responsible for crucifying his savior? Could he have imagined that one day it would be the capital for many people of Christianity? Could he have imagined that the Roman forum would be ruins a tourist attraction, that the Colosseum would have a cross hanging in it because it was, a, it was dedicated to the martyrs who died during that period of persecution. Could he have imagined any of this? No, he could not have. But it happened, don't miss this, it happened, it happened, it happened just as Jesus predicted it would happen. Because there outside of Caesarea Philippi, with 12 men, he said, I will build my gathering and the gates of Hades or hell or death will not overcome it. My death, your death, the deaths of martyrs, generation of death, nothing, 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 nothing is going to stop the advancement of the church. 
because my spirit will fill it. My presence will inhabit it. The church will be the epicenter of the activity of God on this planet till the end of this age. And as you go into all nations and make disciples and invite people to become followers of Jesus, I will be with you until I return. And as you are considering your adult starting point for faith, you can consider a lot of belief systems you can be, consider a lot of truth claims, but at some point along the way, you're gonna have to wrestle with two things that happen. A group of people came to Jerusalem and said, we saw a risen savior. And then for the generations that would follow, the church would grow and grow and grow and expand and expand and expand and exactly what Jesus predicted would happen would in fact happen. And here's the best part of all, perhaps. You, as an individual, Every single one of you, every single one of you have been invited, have been invited to participate in the activity of God in the world by being part of and by associating yourself with a local church. Because this is what God is up to in the world through the compassion of the church, through the message of the church, through the interaction of church with the community, through the influence of the church. And no, the church hasn't always gotten it right. And yes, the church, the history of the church is filled with all kinds of stories that are embarrassing. But that's the point, that in spite of us, in spite of our failure, in spite of our inconsistency, the church continues to influence the world and to grow and to grow and to grow. And it's not because we're smart. And it's not because there's a headquarters somewhere that makes it happen. It's because Jesus said, I will build my gathering and nothing, nothing, nothing is going to stop it. Yeah, amen. Now that fires me up. You'll name your kids Peter and Paul and you'll name your dogs Nero and Caesar, huh? I want to tell you something in a second, but before I get to that, I want us to read some things together. Um, Andy referenced Matthew 16, 18, Matthew 16, 18. So I thought it'd be good if uh, we just read this together. So as it comes up on the screen, Matthew chapter 16, 18, let's read it together. Ready? And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus made that prediction with just 12 people, outcast, nothing to do. A broken people, just like this church. And he's built it. And nothing stops it. Nothing. And it's the only thing, it's the only thing that I've ever seen in this world that can change a heart and change a destiny. It's the only thing that I can see a girl who's been hurt or violated at a young age that can have her heart healed by God deeply, somewhere so deep that they don't even want to think about it. It's the only body of people that can make marriages come to life again that were dead. It's the only thing that can give people hope when it seems like there should be no hope. It's the one thing that we take to us when we lose a loved one, that we have a hope that we'll see them again. And every day since they've died, we grow closer and closer to seeing them again because we believe there's a Christ, there's a church that opened the doors to heaven for us through him. There's nothing like the local church in the local world. We can talk about problems, but until you change your heart, you'll never fix a problem. It may move it forward, but it will never fix it. Jesus is into the problem-fixing business. He's into the hope-giving business. And he's laid all the eggs in the basket of this thing called the church. And guess what? It's prevailing and it's working. And the gates of hell itself will never stop it. And that is worth applauding for. The local church being the hope of the world is one of our 10 key values. It changed my heart. It's changed hundreds, if not thousands, of lives here at this church, your hearts. It's given us a hope. It's restored relationships. It's given us a new focus and a purpose. It's pulled away the, the grips of greed. It's not only changed this area, it's changed all different parts of the country and the world that are watching right now are living in different places. Not just the United States, but other countries. About eight months ago, uh, Kathy came to me and I was at my desk and she dropped a postcard on my lap. And she says, Tom, 
you may be interested in this. Now, I thought it was strange, the postcard that she dropped on our lap. I'm going to give you the backdrop of this. About three months before this, we were looking at a second location, a second campus, not moving from this campus at all, but adding a second campus. This campus is over 80% full in this room. When it's over 80% full, people quit coming. The first service we had hardly had any seats at all. Children's area, you know, we've had to expand. Parking is sometimes tight. So we realized, okay, God, for us to continue to make followers of Jesus, should we open another campus? Well, things came around, and it finally came to the point where we didn't feel that Festus was the campus to do right now at this time. So we didn't. And we still ask the question, God, is there something else that you wanted to do to have another secondary campus? We knew he wasn't done with us. And Kathy hands this postcard. And I look at it, and I thought it was strange that Kathy gave me the postcard. No one should have thrown it away. But somebody had sent her a church that was for sale on a postcard. So I read it, and I thought, okay, Jesus, are you up to something now? And uh, so I looked at the location, and I said, okay, how's the building? This started a period of due diligence where we could see if maybe this is where God wanted us to put another campus. We looked at the building and checked. It was good. We looked at the price. It was good. We looked at the location, and it was good. So during this whole past nine months, I'm looking into it, and everything was great. So then I contacted our realtor, bought this place, and it's just a great guy, a great friend of the church. And I said, could you see if we could buy that building? We could, and he says, okay, he looked, and he came back, and he goes, Tom, it's under contract already. He said, so there's somebody there. And he said, but we could draw, draw up a backup contract to it. You know, if you sell a house and you got a buyer and you think they can't get financing, you put a backup contract. So we put a backup contract on it. And it gave us a while to uh, do some more due diligence, to see how that area would be, to see uh, if God really wanted us there to pray more, to see what doors would be open. About two months ago, roughly, I get a phone call from our real estate agent. He says, hey, Tom, I just want you to know, he said, these guys were sure about this original contract. He said, but now they've pulled out, and now we're the first contract. You're in first position. And then he made the statement, now you've got two months to determine if you think God wants you to take that location. So I got together with Herc and Josh and, and Tony, the pastors here at our church. For the past few months, we've been looking at it and praying about it and trying to find a reason not to go there. God, why would you not want us to go there? Are the things we shouldn't do, so forth? We couldn't find one. So we were convinced as pastors that this was the next step for our church to open our second campus. Not leave this one, but our second one. Then I got some leaders together, 11 key leaders at our church. And I told Herc and Tony and Josh, I said, we're not going to do this unless they're unanimous in consent that they want to do this as well. This past Friday, this past week, they all called and said, it's a go. Let's do it. So we're scheduled to close this month with the one yard line getting ready to go in. Now something could happen and we're going to need your prayer, but it looks like it's a go. So I want to introduce you to campus number two, Oak Bridge City. Watch this picture. I'll show you another picture of it here on the outside. Go back to the first slide if you can. It looks exactly like our church with all the stained glass windows and the crosses and everything, doesn't it? <laughs> the address, I want to tell you, there's something so super, supernatural about this address, I'm going to tell you. It's just phenomenal. I, can't, it, I cannot tell you how great it is of where this is near. The address is 3543 Watson Road. And the size of this building, by the way, is almost the exact same size as this building was when we first moved into it. This was 28,500 square feet. That's roughly 27,500 square feet. Now we've added more to the Children's Wing and the Compassion Center. So it's, it's phenomenal where it's at. And if this, is, if this is not a miracle, God, I do not know. For me, maybe not for you. It is approximately almost exactly one mile from Ted Drew's. Now you think about that. How is that? Is, that is... That's weird, right, huh? So if you go to Ted Drew's off Chippewa, go up a little bit where the road veers, and you guys know where Pietro's is at, it's near that. It used to be Union United Methodist Church. 
And I just want to give you a couple demographics, and I only got a few more minutes to talk with you. But here's some demographics that we had done studies on, and I'm just letting you know. And before I forget to say this, if anybody's interested in knowing more about this church, not this week, but next week at 1030, if you're interested in going to this church, next week at 1030, we'll have an announcement where we have a meeting in here. And at 1230, we'll have an announcement. So after the services. We don't think we're going to be able to open this church, by the way, until about a year from today. So it gives us some time to do some things, to plan and build some teams. But here's some demographics. Within a one-mile radius of Oak Bridge here in Arnold, there's 8,000 people. And that's a good number. Within one mile, there's 8,000 people. Oak Bridge City, there's 19,000 people within a one-mile radius. All right? Two and a half times. Within a three-mile radius of Oak Bridge, Arnold, there's 50,000 people that we still uh, can reach out to and love and, and, and uh, open the light of Christ to. There's 50,000 people. Within three miles of this location, Oak Bridge City, there's 145,000 people. Within a five-mile radius of Oak Bridge, Arnold, there's 95,000 people, a huge number. Within a five-mile radius of this church, there's 380,000 people. Now, I want to share a little bit of my heart with you. Statistics show that in cities all across the country, and St. Louis is right in the heart of this statistic, that only 5 to 10% of the city's population goes to church anymore. There's churches, if you've noticed, in the city closing left and right. There's a whole group of generation called nuns, not N-U-N-S, N-O-N-E-S, nuns, where they don't deny Jesus, they just don't have anything much to do with Jesus. You see what the result is, I believe, for a lot of our cities. Not only is there's bedlam, there's people getting hurt and wounded with regularity that we've never seen in our history. So we prayed about this church, and I could not knock down it. I was looking for reasons not to go there. So I ended up visiting them. And uh, this congregation uh, closed their doors in June of this summer. And I was there before that speaking with them. And I said, they asked me, Tom, do you know how we got our name as a church? And I said, well, I, I'm guessing you combined a couple churches together, and that's how you got your name, Union United Methodist Church. She says, well, you're partially right, but that's not really it. She says, our church started in 1862. And something was going on in 1862 in St. Louis. The city of St. Louis is in martial law. I looked this up. And a little war had just started called the Civil War. And St. Louis happened to be one of those states that was split. The cities was split, part Confederate, part Union. So a group of people, a small group of people got together and they said, we are Union Methodist Church. We are for the people's right to live how they want. The color of their skin won't cause them to be slaves. Now they stood up, now you think about it. That is worth applauding for 155 years ago. A group of people at risk between the fighting of their brothers and sisters, as that issue was hotly contested, stood up and said, we think our king, Jesus, believes all people are equal in his sight. And they stood up during the Civil War. Now, that's the heritage that we get to step into. The building that we're looking at has been there since 1955, roughly 62 years. It's been a light in this community. They've changed different sites, but they've been in the general area for 155 years. I can't find hardly any churches that have been around for 155 years in St. Louis. And I kept thinking in my mind, the church is the hope of the world. This light can't go out there. It can't go out there. For 47 years, they've had a preschool between kids ages two and four with 100 to 125 kids registered. They've showed them the love of Jesus for 47 years. That preschool still wants to stay, and we'd love to have it stay too. What's going to change our city? Talk will help. But what needs to be changed is hearts, and you know that as well as I know that. And the only one that can do that is Christ through his church. I don't know, maybe God's saying our city needs it more than it did in 1862 to have another church line up. Because not only are we fighting this racial strife still, we're fighting evil and immorality at a record pace. We 
front breakdowns of everything that makes life worth living. And maybe God's calling us to be there and to bring some truth and grace into that area. So I started thinking, okay, God, I'm, I'm like 95% there. What do I got to push past? And then I started thinking about the Apostle Paul. If he was walking around and he came to this area with this many people, with not a church like ours in the vicinity, I think he would have said, I need to plant a church in Ephesus. I need to plant one in Corinth. I need to plant one in Thessalonica. And I think I need to plant one in Lindenwood Park in the city of St. Louis right here. Would he do such a thing 2,000 years later? Jesus has been doing that for 2,000 years. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And that's what he's done. That was like the last domino. Okay, God, the church, we're the church. If not us, then who? So then, end of two stories. So I go into the building to see it, and I've been there many times now. And I go into one of the rooms, and when I enter a room, it's on the lower level. And I go into this room, and by me coming into the room, I brought the average age down to about 75. There are like eight women in there all around sewing machines. And I asked them, I said, what are, you, what are you ladies doing? And they said, well, we're sewing, we sew quilts. And they said, well, who are you? And I said, well, my name's Tom, and I'm from a church called Oak Ridge. He goes, you're that church that's, that's trying to buy us. And she said, oh, that'd be so good. And she said, um, would you let us stay here? And I said, well, well, what is it that you do? And she said, well, we, for the last 17 years, we sew quilts, and we've been sewing about 140 to 160 a year. And I said, what do you do with those quilts? She said, we'd go around to the hospitals and give them all to the cancer patients that are in the local hospitals. Yeah. So I politely told them, as politely as I could, I said, I'm sorry, we don't have a quilt ministry, but we will try and help you find another church, maybe in the area, that could help you. No, I didn't say that. Give me a, what's the matter with you guys? You Christians can be so naive at times. Of course not. I said, heck yes. I said, I said, there's no doubt about it. And then she said, I just got one more favor. She said, would you let us use one of these rooms, which is to the back of the room? Would you let us use that for storage? I said, you're not going to believe it. I just got some preliminary drawings from the architects. And on that room, it said storage. They just didn't know the name of your ministry, I guess, yet. I mean, can you imagine that? Second one was, I went into their church with another friend here. The lights were dim. It was down low. This church closed in June. No activity there except the preschool that's going on. When I happened to went there, I went into the sanctuary that you saw a little bit of. It was very dark, except for the gleaming of lights coming in through the beautiful stained glass windows. But up front, I could see a light turned on. And it was a light from a piano. You know how they have the piano lights where you just turn on to light up your music? And I could see that light, and I could see that there was a lady playing, and I could hear the music, and she was playing a pipe organ that had been there for so long. And the music sounded great, filled the building. But then all of a sudden, I started to think, if we don't buy this building, may there ever be music played in this again to the glory of Jesus Christ. And I started thinking about a song that I knew was written in the late 1700s that had probably been played hundreds if not thousands of times in that building to bring people hope and peace and comfort and truth. And I asked her, I said, could you do me one favor? I said, could you play Amazing Grace? Do you know that song? She says, why, of course I do. I've been the organist here for quite a long time. She starts off with one low octave, the whole Amazing Grace. I won't run it for you guys low octave. I said, I'm thinking in my mind, this is phenomenal. She goes up a whole nother octave. Then she goes up a whole nother octave. She goes up four octaves. And by the end of the time, that room is just booming with amazing grace. Tears are running down my face. And I'm thinking, Lord, this cannot be the last time that this is ever played to the glory of your son in this location, in our city, at this building. This can't be that way. It was a I can only tell you, it was about a spiritual moment as I've had with the song. 
So we were there Friday, and I wanted to hear the full acoustics with people singing. So I went and got Diana and Kristen, bribed them with a lunch, brought them to the building. And as they're eating, I said, look, I'm going to ask you guys to come in and sing in that building. And you guys can pick any song you want. And I thought it'd be no big deal. They'd hum a couple bars. That's all it would be. And, you know, we could hear, so I'd move around the building. So they said, well, this is a little pressure. I said, yeah, I know this could be the first time that our church, our gathering of people, actually sing to the glory of Christ in here. I had no idea what they're going to pick. They're looking around, and we step in, and there's just a few of us in the room. And they go up front with a little iPhone. And you know what chose the song they chose? Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Now, they sang it. And I would almost assuredly tell you that no one has sang it better in that building. But the power of it was the same thing. I had to wipe away tears, knowing that this might not be the last time this has ever changed. That children's children that you may not even know yet, they're going to someday worship our king there because of you, because of the church, because Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And we sang it, and it was wonderful, and they sang the whole song. And I said, you know what, God? If this can go through and can get closed, and I need your prayers during this time period, I said, then when we go into that building again, maybe that should be the first time we sing it together as a body. So then I called Nick. I said, Nick, would you do me a favor? Could we sing the song that Diane and Kristen sang Friday to the same God who inhabited that room, to the same one who loves us, who has a hope and a plan and a strategy for all of us. So with that said, I want to say a prayer, and then we get to sing to the one who guides us and loves us. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the miracle, the miracle of the church, that we live in the age of the church that Jesus ushered in, and someday he'll come and he'll take this church out, and he'll usher in whatever time comes. But till then, We get to be part of what your son is at the center of that he does still today. Father, may we lift these words to you. And as we lift them to you, may you touch down deep into our soul and give us a hope and a love that we can't even account for, but we can just feel. Father, we thank you. It's in the mighty name of your son, Jesus, that we gather. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand and let's pray soon.
So I wanted to challenge some of you. You're the church. You're the gathering that Jesus started 2,000 years ago. And I've looked at our church, and I've had time to reflect through this. 14 years ago, God called this little ecclesia, this little gathering of people, about 10 of us, said, I want you to start this church. That was chapter one. And it was an exciting time. And I wouldn't change it for anything. And I'm, and I'm glad I had a front row view to watch it all. Then 10 years after that, God starts another chapter. And he says, you've been in this movie theater long enough. Now you need to reach more people. And there's a building I'm going to put in your laps that there's no way you should get, but you're going to get it. And that was four years ago when we moved into this building. That was the second chapter. I think for many of you that are here now, you're able to enter into the third chapter. We've got a lot of work to here to do in Jefferson County and St. Louis County. But maybe God's calling you to step up, stay into this, see what happens. Or maybe he's calling you into chapter three and saying, go to the second campus, into the city. You've got to pray about that. To raise a light here, to keep it shining bright, to raise a light there, that is the church. That's where Jesus Christ leads it. And he's still leading this one. But I want you to think about where, where you're at. It takes all of us to do what I think Christ wants to be done through his body. Some of you can leave today and go right outside and sign up to start serving here. We've got about a year, I think, to prepare for this, to see what God does. We've got a lot of praying to do. We've got a lot of opportunity that God gives us before us. I think heaven and earth hangs in the balance for many. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the church. We thank you for the truth and the power of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that you use imperfect people to point people to your perfect son. Father, may we continue to be fully devoted to you and in love with you and continue to grow in you. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Thanks for coming next week. We start How to Be Rich. Thanks for coming.